Tonight's story involves a 23-year-old mother of two from Montana who went missing three years ago. Jermaine Charlo is her name, and with a lot of help from our great affiliate KPAX, we have her story tonight. It's been three years since Jermaine Charlo, a 23-year-old mother of two, rounded a corner outside the Badlander Bar in Missoula, Montana, and vanished. Video surveillance from outside the bar on June 15th of 2018 shows the last time she was seen alive. Her disappearance sparked protests across the state, and in 2020, public outcry about Charlo's case pushed local tribe leaders to launch a new pilot program for dealing with the nationwide crisis of missing and murdered indigenous people. It goes back several generations, so... This, this isn't a new problem, but we're trying to figure out new solutions. Even with all the attention from the public, her case remains unsolved. Guy Baker is the lead detective on the case. Well, it's not a closed case. It's not a cl cold case. Uh, it's still very active. Baker is the second detective to be assigned to the case. He took over the investigation 11 days after Charlo went missing. I think you always look to the past to see if you can do better. Um, you know, you try to do the best job you can under the circumstances, but, you know, looking back, some things could have been done a little differently that I think uh, would have been beneficial, but uh, nothing was uh, done wrong or uh, was detrimental, I should say, to the investigation. Charlo's ex-boyfriend, Michael DeFrance, pleaded guilty to assaulting Jermaine in 2013, five years before her disappearance. But in new court documents, prosecutors allege that in June and October of 2018, DeFrance violated the terms of that conviction by knowingly possessing firearms and ammunition. DeFrance entered a not guilty plea to the new charges during his appearance in U.S. District Court. Jermaine Charlo's relatives were in attendance. I knew he was in trouble for uh, having a partner family member assault against Jermaine multiple times and then he's posting on Facebook pictures of himself holding firearms so I was really hoping that you know that would be addressed and I'm happy that it was finally addressed and that he is held responsible for his actions. Authorities have not released any information connecting to France to Charlo's disappearance. I just hope that this is a stepping stone in the right direction to like where we can actually find Jermaine and bring peace to our family. Okay, folks, if you have any information, you can call the Missoula County Police 406-552-6300, 406-552-6300, or the Flathead Tribal Police at 406-675-4700, 406-675-4700, to get some sense of justice and an answer in this case. Let's bring back in our guest, still with us, retired FBI Special Agent Bobby Chacon and retired police commander and host of the Profiling Evil podcast, Mike King. Also joining us tonight by phone in Missoula, Montana, is an anchor and reporter with our great affiliate KPAX, Jill Valley, is with us. And in Toronto, Canada, journalist and host of Stolen, the Search for Jermaine podcast, Connie Walker is with us. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, Jill uh, Valley from KPAX, uh, let me begin with you. Um, are, are, is there any more information, the, the latest in this investigation? Uh, where exactly does everything stand now, three years later? Well, I think at this point we're still waiting to get more information from the investigators and Guy Baker. He is a tough nut to crack. He knows stuff, but he's, as Connie Walker could tell you, he's not one to reveal what he knows a lot about in this investigation, because if you look at the whole picture, it does seem kind of circumstantial, but then it was really interesting when we got the information when Michael DeFrance ended up in federal court, as you can imagine, that caused quite a buzz in the newsroom, and we all showed up in mass that day, and his defense attorney looked at some of our, one of our executive producers, for example, and he said, why are you here? Why are you interested in this case? And her response was, why don't you tell me? So he clearly knew why there's an interest in this case. And I think that was the day we thought, okay, are we going to get some more answers about this? But it would appear that, you know, his, the weapons charge that he's facing right now is, is that a placeholder? I think an investigator or a prosecutor could tell you more about that. But it seems like there was slight movement ahead with his appearance in court, even though it was unrelated to her disappearance. It does make you wonder, 
okay, so what's the next shoe to drop with the information that's going to come out of that case? Connie Walker, let me ask you, um, what was going on in Jermaine's life? What was happening right around the time that she disappeared? Yeah, we spent a year looking into Jermaine's unsolved disappearance and dove really deep into her life, uh, you know, directly in the days and weeks leading up to her disappearance, but also in the years prior to that. You know, Jermaine Charlo is, is unfortunately part of this epidemic of violence that so many Indigenous women and girls face. Uh, and so our eight-part podcast really dove deep into her disappearance. And Jermaine, you know, as you mentioned, was a mother of two. She was a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. And her family, on, on you know, the day after she went missing, was immediately concerned that they couldn't, they didn't hear from her. You know, Jermaine was somebody who was very active on social media, very in touch with her yaya, her grandmother, Vicky Morgeau. And as soon as they didn't hear from her, they were immediately concerned. And, and they called the person that she was last seen with to try to get some answers about her disappearance. And that was her ex-boyfriend, Michael DeFrance, who, uh, as Jill mentioned, was in federal court recently on a weapons charge, which, uh, although is not directly tied to Jermaine's disappearance, um, is connected to Jermaine because he had a prior conviction for partner or family member assault against her. And our investigation found that although Detective Guy Baker, uh, you know, has says he has numerous theories about about the unsolved disappearance of Jermaine Charlo, a large part of the police investigation has focused on Michael DeFrance. Uh, you know, police have searched his property uh, twice. They have, um, you know, uh, he was the last person to be seen with Jermaine. Detective Guy Baker told us um, that he originally told uh, family and told police that he dropped her off uh, at a grocery store in downtown Missoula and then later, uh, you know, changed his, his uh, story and said he dropped her off a little ways from there. Uh, her cell phone was traced to the DeFrance or near the DeFrance property on the night of her disappearance after uh, Mr. DeFrance claimed that he dropped her off. Um, but as Jill mentioned, like he's never been charged in Jermaine's disappearance. We still don't know what happened to Jermaine Charlo. And Michael DeFrance has never been, uh, you know, officially named a suspect by police. Uh, but certainly I think there are so many questions and her family has so many questions about not only her disappearance, but about about the police investigation into her disappearance and and why it took so long to get her reported missing and why it took police so long to conduct some of the searches uh, that they did for, for Jermaine. Bobby Chacon, retired FBI special agent. What's it going to take, do you think, to get to the next level where you can perhaps uh, put some more pressure or bring some charges in this case? Well, I think you're at the next level now, in fact, because if you look at what's happened, he violated the conditions of his state charges on that domestic violence type charge that he had with displaying the weapon. That rightfully could have been prosecuted on a state level, a state or local level. Instead, now it's in the hands of the federal government. That's a strategic investigative decision. Somebody made a decision to prosecute him in federal court rather than state court. That means the prosecutor at the state level and the prosecutor at the federal level got together as the investigators did. Uh, I've been in that situation. I've taken state gun cases federally because the rules of evidence are different in federal court. Um, the penalties are different in federal court. You can put a lot more pressure on somebody in federal court. There's no more parole. Uh, we did away with parole on the federal level years ago. So you're going to serve your entire sentence if you get convicted. Um, so there's, I think they've taken the next step. I think this is a strategic decision to take this gun charge federally um, and, and that's the direction they want to go. They are going to lean on him. They are going to tell him that the federal penalties for this crime are much greater than the state penalties for it. And I think that's why they've done it. Mike King, how do you think they solved the case? What do they need? Well, yeah, I, th I think a couple of things that are really uh, positive that have happened. And congratulations to the podcast side on Stolen, uh, to the media. But the thing that I think is really interesting is they tipped a hand a little bit in the in some of the media reports. The defense is concerned about the, the feds or the state taking some DNA. So is that pointing back to maybe there's something early on that was collected that they couldn't get a, a chance or a shot at before. But the thing I really like about this case is that we're doing th this the right way. Instead of the who done it, we're, we're really looking at who is the victim here and why did she become a victim? And, and as those answers uh, come, it's gonna really point to why she becomes victimized. And that really helps us 
understand among a pool of suspects or even an individual who's more probable for these kinds of things. And Jill Valley, before we uh, wrap things up here, uh, give us the, the, the big picture on, on how this case and, and people involved in this case has impacted the, the issue of, of Native American women as victims and, and trying to uh, help them and help solve cases and prevent cases like this. Well, I tell you, I think between Jermaine and even another woman who disappeared a year before her, Ashley Loring, heavy runner from north central Montana, their faces are on billboards and they've become something that gives us more awareness for the missing and murdered indigenous women and, and people and boys and really everyone out there who is facing this where they go missing and there's never any resolution because of cases like this and kind of the, the constant media attention to it and that wonderful podcast by Connie, there's something now called a snowbird fund that's brand new. And what that does is provide money to families so they can do their own searches, print flyers, do billboards, you know, help volunteers with water and food as they go out and search for their loved one. And then as the story talked about ahead of time, it's that first ever um, collaboration between the Tribal Community Response Plan that's going to help the jurisdictions come together, because sometimes that trips people up. So there is an effort underway to pay more attention to these cases, to get on them quicker, and to, to really find them valid when a family member calls and says, my loved one's missing, to not get blown off, to say, no, 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 we need to take a good look at this. So I know those families of those missing women probably never wanted them to be the face of this movement, but what has happened is now people are paying attention and things are happening. So it's been going on for generations. Maybe now is the time where people are finally going to, you know, take it seriously and, and make it stop because this is very unfair. Absolutely. Very Absolutely. Jill Valley, KPAX, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Connie Walker, host of Stolen the Search for Jermaine. Great podcast, an important series. Please check it out, folks. Uh, Mike King, Bobby Chacon. Uh, we'll see you guys again real soon. Thank you yeah. as well.